Hi everyone, I've come to give you a very warm personal welcome to the People's Church Falkirk online service. We know that life is journey. Some do the journey alone and some take Jesus with them. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I personally have tasted and find that the journey is so much better with Jesus. Pastor David will lead us today in the Word of God. So I hope you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. And happy Mother's Day to all you mums out there. Have a fantastic day and God bless. I was lost with a broken heart You picked me up, now I'm set apart From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Saviour's hands You are more than my words could say I follow you, look for all my days Fix my eyes, following your ways Forever free in unending grace Cause you are, you are In the midst of the darkest night, let your love be the shining light, breaking chains that were holding me. You sent your sun down and set me free. Everything in this world will fade. I'm pressing on till I see your face. I will live that your will be done. I won't stop till your kingdom come. Cause you are, you are, you are. You are my freedom, we'll lift you higher, you are, you are, you are, you are my freedom, we'll lift you higher, you are, you are, you are my freedom, we'll lift you higher, you are, you are, you are my freedom.
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a burden came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the third Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Majesty To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the old creation, you did not despise the loss. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. As we gather around the Lord's table in our own homes this morning, let us remember on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said to eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood the stew as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So let us all take the bread and give thanks for his broken body.
Let us take the wine and give thanks for that precious blood that was shed, giving thanks to the Lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. O precious Lamb of Calvary, we give you all the honour, praise and worship. Hi, my name is Leanne, and we'll give a quick testimony. I was saved when I was 10 at a Billy Graham, camp, Graham campaign at Parkhead. Up until I was 20, I went to church regular. I then moved to Abbey Moore and met my ex-husband and started my family. We moved back to Falkirk. I was pregnant with my oldest, who was quickly followed by my other two. I would try and attend church when I could, but a mixture of young children and financial reasons meant I couldn't. About six years ago, I went through a really hard time, which resulted in my marriage breaking down. It was after this I found out I was going through financial and emotional abuse, which I still receive a, a support group for. With my mum's help, I returned back to church. I got my kids dedicated and got more involved in the church. My ex still makes things hard, but I have plenty of support from the church and my family when I need it. Through all the hard times, a passage that keeps coming to my, my mind is Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future. I might not, not know what I have in the future, but I do know that whatever it is, God will show me in his time. Many times through life, uh, we get caught up in the business of it all, and um, times it can become overwhelming, but we are reminded that we have a friend in Jesus, we are reminded that we have the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. We are reminded that God is our Father and we can trust in Him at all times. I hope this blesses someone as much as this has blessed me as this song came to my spirit this week and I'm just so thankful that uh, we have Him always with us. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never, never, never be discouraged because we can take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend that is so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus, he knows of every weakness. So 
you can take it to the Lord in prayer. And I'm reminded that I can trust in him. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus. How I trust him, how have proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you and I have proved you o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, my precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you more. God bless you. Good morning, church. I'm grateful to God and the pastor Rick for the opportunity to share my testimony today. On this Mother's Day, I'm once again reminded of the faithfulness of God in my life. I've experienced the awesome power of God in many seasons of life. And today, I'm sharing a pivotal milestone in my journey as a Christian. Many years ago, precisely in 1994, I was in the wilderness season of life. I just lost my firstborn son at seven and a half months after a week in intensive care for an illness the doctors never fully diagnosed. I remember returning home from work on that particular day to pick my son from a family friend who was also providing childcare support and was told he had been running a fever and had been taken to a nearby clinic for observation. There had been no indications of him being unwell at the time I dropped him off in the morning. My husband and I decided to take him to one of the private hospitals in Lagos, one of the top private hospitals that evening. The doctors gave him some medicine and asked that we bring him back the following day after observing him through the night. Early the following day, we did exactly this. And within the space of three hours, a chain of events began to unfold. I noticed my son was dribbling saliva at the side of his mouth and the doctors decided to admit him. From being admitted into hospital, this situation degenerated into him being moved into ICU. And within a week in total shock, we were arranging to bury our son. I recall clearly on the day that he died, before I was told that he had passed, I cried to God for help and surrendered my life to Christ in the place of prayer in my bedroom. When I look back, that was the very beginning of strength and courage for weathering the billows of life. You see, before this time, I was neither hot nor cold. I had been born to a Muslim family, and although I was not a practicing Muslim, I also wasn't a Christian. I was simply sitting on the fence of life. After we buried our son, my husband and I realized that life is a battleground and that we needed God to fight for us. We began to look for a church to attend and through prayers, 
we were led to a Pentecostal church where we began to worship. It was our assumption that now that we were Christians, life will become perfect. I got pregnant the following year and carried the pregnancy to full term, 42 weeks precisely, only to be told that the son in my womb had died and I had to go through labor for about nine hours to give birth to a child we already knew was dead. It seemed like we had been forsaken by God as we couldn't understand how God seemingly failed us. Now that I have grown a little older in faith, I have come to understand that God never fails. Zephaniah 3, 5. It is impossible for him to fail. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 10, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. We remain committed to God. And through counseling and prayers, we receive strength to continue on our journey of faith. Five minutes doesn't give me enough time to tell my story. So to summarize, in July 1997, God wiped away my tears and gave me a song. In September 1999, he gave me cause to smile again and gave me another song. Then I said to myself, the Lord has wiped away my tears and restored to me the joy of having two sons. But you see, it is impossible for the enemy to be on equal footing with the God we serve. And when I had considered my cup full, according to his word in Psalm 23 verse 5, he made my cup run over and gave me a daughter in January 2011. I call her the icing on my cake. God is immensely faithful and though we may not understand why he allows the difficult seasons of our life, I can testify he is weaving a beautiful tapestry out of the misery. I'm able to comfort others today with the same comfort that I received. My household today serves the Lord and in many ways we are vessels unto honor in his hands. Whatever may be your situation today, lift up your eyes to the hills for help cometh from the Lord God Almighty who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Amen. To God alone be the glory for he has done marvelous things in my life. Hallelujah. Show.
I'd like to say good morning to all mothers out there this, this morning on Mother's Day. And I'll do the reading this morning. It's from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 18 and verses 23 to 24. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. You, you, com you compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, eh, but lo, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You have beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it attain unto it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yes, the darkness hide, uh, hides uh, not from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you have possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes did see my substance, you being, yet being, un un unperfect, and in your book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. When as yet there was none of them, how precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sun of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Good morning, People's Church Falkirk. So to all our PCF and friends, Happy Mother's Day. I know it can be a sad time for many uh, as well, but Happy Mother's Day and just remember the good times and have a great day. And I want to thank people who took part in the service uh, today and thank you for the reading of God's Word as well as we take our final look as our journey in looking at the Psalms. Obviously we're not doing every Psalm, but we've selected a few over these weeks and looking at the Psalms we're finishing up with Psalm 139 as we heard from our reading and today this is a well-known and very notable Psalm searching for significance searching for significance that's the title this morning there are times I am sure most of us go through some sort of identity crisis which you could really say is you are searching for significance. The end of our search is found this morning as we look at Psalm 139. Four paragraphs, if you like, six verses each, and we will find four reasons that we are significant this morning and important to God. And number one is, God knows all about us. God knows all about us, the first six verses, you know, the great God who created all things knows everything about you and about me. So the theological lingo, God is omniscient, all-knowing. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. Adoration to Jehovah, the all-knowing God, only the true God could know us and understand us. He knows our nature and our very character. I love what C.H. Spurgeon says, how wonderful the contrast between the observer and the observed. 
Jehovah and me. Yet this most intimate connection exists and therein lies our hope. Let the reader sit still a while and try to realise the two poles of this statement. The two poles of this statement. The Lord and poor puny man. And he will see much to admire and much to wonder at. Friends, O oh Lord, you have searched me thoroughly and have known me. And the Hebrew word translated search there is the word hukar. Hukar. And it means to examine intimately. God knows everything about you and me, past, present and future. He is intimately acquainted with every detail of our lives. How does Hebrews 4 and 13 remind us of that fact in the second part of the verse? But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Everything is naked, naked and exposed. But all things are open and exposed in the Amplified, naked and defenceless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows everything about us. He goes on to say, you know when I sit down, when I stand up, you know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home, you know everything I do. In other words, he's acquainted with all our ways, what we are doing, what we're up to, all about our habits, what's going on even when we feel we're on our own. He observes us as we quietly sit, knows when we are on the move, from the casual acts to the major movements of our lives. Whether we are sinking or ascending, we are seen, we are known, and we are read by Jehovah. Movements, thoughts, actions, and words, all known by him. He knows our path, he's acquainted with our ways, he is familiar with the all friends. Nothing is hidden from him, and nothing surprises him. C.H. Spurgeon again says, Our paths may be habitual or accidental. They may be open or secret. But with them all, the most holy one is well acquainted. This should fill us with awe, so that we sin not. This should fill us with courage, so that we fear not. This should fill us with delight, so that we mourn not. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. Few things reveal the omniscience of God, like the fact that he knows what I'm thinking before there is, what does it say? There is a word in my tongue and he knows it all together. God knows what we think, say, before we even think it. We need to pray every day. Those words in Psalm 19 and 14. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing to you. Because he knows our very thoughts and what we're going to say. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. What does David write in verse 5 of our passage? You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. You go before me and follow me. In other words, you place your hand of blessing on my head. And the original says, Thou hast beset me behind and before. And the Hebrew word translated beset is su'er. And it means to cram or confine. In other words, God keeps his guiding, restraining hand on us. So he knows everything that we need. This is an answer to what prayer we find at the end of the psalm that we're dealing with today in verse 24. And lead me in the way everlasting. He's keeping us on track. David puts it another way in his most famous psalm. God leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And as David thinks about our all-knowing God and how he leads us, he writes, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. 
It is high. I cannot at attain unto it. It's too great for me to understand. Can we attain, reach, and realize, or have any idea of his power, his wisdom, and his holiness? Why does God know all about us? Is it because he's nosy? No. The reason God knows all about us is found in Jeremiah 31. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you, my people. And you, his people this morning, he loves you with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, he's drawn us. Listen to this whole psalm. So beautifully put, so in words of poetry, you may say, by James Montgomery. Searcher of, of hearts, to the unknown, the inmost secrets of my breast. At home, abroad, in crowds alone, thou markest my rising and my rest. My thoughts far off, through every maze, source, stream, and issue, all my ways. How from thy presence should I go, or whether from thy spirit flee, since all above, around, and below exist in thine immensity. If up to heaven I take my way, I meet thee in eternal day. If in the grave I make my bed, with worms and dust, lo, thou art there. If on the wings of morning sped, Beyond the ocean, I am prepared. I feel thy all controlling, controlling will, and thy right hand upholds me still. Let darkness hide me if I say, darkness can no concealment be. Night on thy rising shines like day, darkness and light are one with thee. For thou, my embryo, formed this view, ere her own babe my mother knew. In me thy workmanship displayed, a miracle of power I stand, fearfully, wonderfully made, and framed in secret by thine hand. I lived ere into being brought through thine eternity of thought. How precious are thy thoughts of peace, O God, to me, how great the sum. New every morn, they never cease. They were, they are, and yet shall come. In number and encompass more than ocean sands and ocean shore. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, my inmost soul, survey. And warn thy servant to depart from every false and evil way. So shall thy truth my guidance be to life and immortality. It was James Montgomery, friends. God loves us more than we can ever imagine. That's why he knows everything about us. Searching for significance this morning, God knows all about us. His omniscient power. God is near us at all time. Number two, God is near us at all time. In the next six verses, David tells us there is nowhere that we can go to get away from God. So back to that also theological lingo, he is omnipresent or everywhere, which means we are always in his presence. David writes, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, or Sheol, behold, you are there. Friends, if we cannot get away from his presence, then the dreadful work of sin must be very offensive in his face. Man is always somewhere, but friends, God is everywhere. And the Hebrew word translated hell there or Sheol means the grave or realm of the dead. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David doesn't stop there. He says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. The wings of the morning, friends, a rising sun. The sun often shoots across the heavens at great speed, shining on the sea. If we were to try and outrun God according to this, it would be impossible. God will will be and still is with us, friends. No horizon is too far 
for him to reach us? Would you say praise the Lord? Would you say praise the Lord in your home this morning? To explain this, there's two hypothetical questions that God asks in Jeremiah 23 and verse 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. You see, David continues, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. This means God doesn't need light to see because he created light and existed before light as we know it began. God in whom there is no darkness is near us during the darkest night and the darkest times of our lives, friends. When you feel in that deep despair, when you are at your lost, when there seems to be no way out, when it seems as dark as it will ever get, he is there. Say that, friends. He is there. I think Mr. Moody had the right idea. He will always be with us. So why do we so often, you know, think that it's all over? We think so little of ourselves, friends. God is near us at all time. What does Mr. Moody say regarding eternity? Old Moody, never ending life. D.L. Moody said, I was down in Texas some time ago and I happened to pick up a newspaper and in it they called me Old Moody. Honestly, I had never been called old before. I went to my hotel and looked in the looking glass. I can't conceive of getting old. I have a life that is never going to end. Death may change my position, but not my condition, not my standing with Jesus Christ. Old, I wish you all felt as young as I do here tonight. Why, I am only 62 years old. If you meet me in a million years hence, then I will be young. Read that 91st Psalm with long life, will I satisfy him? That doesn't mean 70 years. Would that satisfy you? Did you ever see a man or a woman of 70 satisfied? Don't they want to live longer? You know that 70 wouldn't satisfy you? Would 80, would 90, would 100? If Adam had lived to be a million years old and then had to die, he wouldn't be satisfied. With long life will I satisfy him, life without end. Don't call me old. Don't call me old, Mr. Moody says. I'm only 62. I have only begun to live. He knew that God had made him. God had fashioned him for purpose. And friends, in that he knew God was near at all times. That's why Jesus makes a promise to us in Matthew 28 and 20. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Searching for significance, God knows all about us. God is near us at all time. God is near us at all time. God created us, number three. We are incredible creations. Do you believe that this morning? Of the all-powerful God which in theological lingo means he is omnipotent. With inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David writes, for thou hast possessed my reins. He has already said, I will praise thee. In other words, for you have formed my inward parts. You covered me. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous. And how well I know it. He holds the reins. The owner, not just the indweller or the observer, but the Lord of my life. Can you say that this morning? Is he the Lord of your life this morning? Or is it just when it suits you? He doesn't just want to inspect and visit. But he wants to take up residence in your life. 
The all-powerful God knows all about you. He created that genetic mix and he made you, the Hebrew word translated, covered there. He covered us. You covered me in my mother's womb. And that word covered is sokak. And it means to entwine or to weave. Your parents contributing those chromosomes containing DNA, the chemical blueprint that is you with all the hereditary characteristics. God creates your unique personality, the talents and the gifts made for his purpose for our lives. And what a great subject for Mother's Day. In the womb, protected and known by God. And he goes on to say, I will praise you. This, friends, is a good resolve. Praise the Lord this morning. Those who are praising God are ready to praise. Your adoration is already at hand, ready to offer. You can never be ready too soon to praise. Even through creation, friends, he gave us reasons for praising him. Praising for those wonderful works, amazing that they are in every way. David goes on to say, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. My substance, friends, and that word substance is otsem in this verse. Power or strength. It refers to more than just a skeleton. It includes our abilities, our talents, every part of our makeup as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. In the original context or original text, it's curiously wrought. And that's the word rokam, and it means to embroider. To embroider. This means you were created with great care and detail. The lowest parts of the earth means in the depths of that womb, the rem a remote and visible to the eye place is where God works on the individual. individual. And God is working in you this morning. You might think you've been abandoned, you're left, you're left aside. God is working in you. Just open up your heart to him. Let him have his way in your life. Cry out to him just as David did. And just let him know oh, that you want him to come and visit you in your home. As the day is still going a day and month after month. And we seem to be in these times of darkness. Friends, we have the light of the world and his presence in our lives. Don't fear this morning, friends. A remote and visible to the eye places where God works on the individual. Verse 16. You saw me before I was born. Again in the King James it says, Thine eyes did see my substance. There's that word again. Just like the vessel on the wheel of the potter, he sees it all. He knows our shape and he can fashion us. Now from verse 15 to 16, that word substance has a different meaning. And now the word translated substance is golem. And that is a word and it means embryo. Embryo. As someone clearly states that I read the other day. It goes like this, someone has said that if a pregnant woman had windows in their stomachs, it would end all abortions. Because an unborn baby can't be seen by human eyes, or godless, our godless culture thinks it's okay to kill the unborn children whom God so lovingly wove together, knit together, embroidered together. Why is God so involved in creating us? David says in the latter part of verse 16, And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. The days of our lives, friends, fashioned by God, our unique talents and our gifts, personalities, can all be used for him. Even before we were born, he has a purpose. He has a plan this morning. Then he creates us to the best to fulfill that divine purpose. Say praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. We all know it in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Created. Created. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. 
For you were born that we should walk in them. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. You're anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. As we heard the other evening from Pastor Pearson on our Zoom study, David had his fears. He chose the better option, overcoming, conquering. He chose to have faith in his Lord and God provided. This is why, too, that we see this morning that God has a plan for our lives. Choose to be faithful this morning. Be that soul winner. Preach the word in every season, friends. And see what you will accomplish. What about the life of A.T. Robertson? Dr. A.T. Robertson was the greatest scholar of his time on the Greek New Testament. He wrote more than 50 scholarly books on the New Testament. His big grammar, as he called it, 1,400 and 54 pages was recognized worldwide as a classical work on the Greek New Testament. His former students always will remember him as being hard on them. One day he said to me about his students, they will be preaching the New Testament for the rest of their lives and I want them to know it. Friends, if you want to know the New Testament, if you want to know the Word of God, you need to read the Word of God. And he was a teacher, a scholar, getting it into his students that they would go out there with that good news. Praise the Lord. He had a great passion for souls. His former students may find it hard to visualize him during the invitation in a revival meeting. He would leave the pulpit and walking up and down the aisles, exhorting lost people to receive Christ as their Savior. Oh, is that, is that something that's in your heart this morning? And many times he did so. I sat in his, the writer says, I sat in his senior Greek uh, class in, at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on a Monday afternoon in September 1934. I was not more than 15 feet from him, not knowing a stroke was coming on him that would take his life an hour and a half later. On the Friday before that, he gave what was probably his greatest testimony about the New Testament. But to our class, he said, young gentlemen, I have been studying, teaching, preaching, and writing about the New Testament for more than 50 years. But I never opened my Greek New Testament, but that I see something I never saw before. You want to see something you never saw before? Open your Bible. Read the Word of God. Day in and day out, He will always give you something fresh. After his death, a student received permission to take a picture of his desk just as he left it. And the writer says he had a, a, a copy and a print of that picture. Dr. Robertson had been translating the Greek New Testament into English for a publisher. He had just finished Matthew's account on feeding the 5,000. Papers and reference books were spread out on his desk. His pencil and his green eye shades that he wore when studying and writing were laying on the page in which he had been working. In the midst of that busy task, he laid down his pencil, took off his eye shades, picked up his class books, and taught his class. And then he went home and died. Then he went home and died. Friends, what a purpose this man knew for his life to know that New Testament, you know, and to have that faithfulness. God's masterpiece, new in Christ. What will he use you today? David thinks on the superabundance of God's thoughts towards him. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They number the grains of sand. David was not worried that God knew all about him. He was not alarmed. He was comforted, in fact, that God would think on us should be to the believer, to you and I, a great treasure and a pleasure. The same is precious to God. He thinks of him tenderly in numerous ways, continually. Imagine God thinking about you and I. 
God thought you important and he created you, friends. And when I wake up, you are still with me. The Bible often uses words like sleep and awake as euphemisms for death and resurrection. And you know, in Daniel 12 and 2, it says, Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Therefore, the phrase, when I awake, seems to refer to death, followed by resurrection. And this means from the moment of conception in our mother's womb, and even after death, God created us for significance. You're created with significance in mind. You're important to God. God knows all about us. God is near us all the time. God created us. And fourthly and finally, God will lead us. Surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. David is claiming that there is no doubt that God has seen the transgressions of the wicked which have been done in his sight. Crimes committed before the judge are unlikely to go unpunished. If God is grieved, friends, with the evil, it will be natural for him to remove the offending object. The God who sees the evil will slay the evil. Quite often, with earthly sovereigns, sin may go unpunished for lack of evidence. The law may be left because the judge seems to have no energy or drive to carry out the law. This is not the case with God, the living God, the true God. He loves holiness, friends, and he hates wrong. He will carry on war to the death with those whose hearts and lives are wicked. God will not put up with wickedness. No matter what's happening in our world today, God will not put up with wickedness. If anything is sure, this is sure, that he will ease and relieve him of his enemies. And if he's doing that for David, he'll do it for us, friends. Verses 19 to 22, David is really talking about evil by condemning it and then claiming God's enemies are his enemies. What does he say? Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved at those that rise up against thee? And the Hebrew word translated hate there is sonne, and it means to reject. How does God use the word in Malachi 1 and 3? But Esau I have hated. In the Bible, the word hate sometimes means to choose one thing over another, just like it does there in Malachi 1.3. But in certain contexts, the word hate is also used to indicate that we should stay away from people who want to draw us away from God. That's why too many Christians have fallen back the way, fallen into sin, because they're allowing people to distract them. In certain contexts, the word hate is also used to indicate we should stay away. Everybody says stay away from people who want to draw us away from God. If people aren't doing you good and they're drawing you away from God, you need to do something about it, friends. You're out there to win them and pray for them. You know, but friend, don't let them drag you down. We're not <laughs> talking of the emotional sense here about hate. He who does not love does not know God, but God is love. God is the same in both Old and New Testaments. Leviticus 19 and 18. But you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. To let God lead us and avoid evil like David, we should pray as he did. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David wants no association with these evildoers and traitors. He is appealing to God. He wants no fellowship or even a trace of it left with him. It would do, it would do us good and it would do Christians good to leave the past behind. No hankering back to the old associates living the old life. We are new friends this morning. We're washed and we're cleansed and we're children of God this morning. Let people see the difference in you and I in these days. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. David is praying, God, examine my heart. Have a good look at my thoughts. He wants sin traced. And he wants it removed. Do not let sin be unknown and undiscovered remaining in our hearts, friends. 
He's saying, tell me, Lord, is there any wicked way in me? By fire and water, let me be examined. Cleanse my heart, but clear out my mind as well. Romans 12 and 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us pray like David. Friends, we cannot hide sin. Salvation lies the other way. Make the plain discovery of evil and break every tie from it this morning. Break every chain, friends, this morning. You find a great truth in Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who really knows how bad it is? It's perverse and corrupt and severely mortally sick. Our own hearts can deceive us, thinking how good we are. And that won't change. It's desperately wicked. But if we leave unchecked by God, we make the excuse for sin. So all the more reason to ask God to expose any sin in our lives and cry, Lord, lead us in the way everlasting. Friends, each one of us is significant. Are you searching for significance this morning? God knows all about us. God is near us all the time. God created us and God will lead us. Give your life over to Christ this morning. Let God through his son oh, bring salvation to your life. That you may know him through all eternity. That you will know your sins forgiven. That you can have that heart searched and cleansed and, oh, and made clean this morning. Just surrender your life to Jesus. You say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my life. I hand it over to you this morning. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. And give me boldness to tell others that I have surrendered my life to you. That's what you need to pray this morning, friend, as we end this service. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you on this Mother's Day. And we talk about being in that womb. Talk about how we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that we're known by you. But Lord, we thank you that you search us and you know us. You know all about us. And you've planned us before we're even born. You know, for a purpose. And so, Lord, I would just ask, Lord, that even today, Lord, you would take us on with yourself. Lord, let this word be refreshing to every heart and every life, everyone who would listen to it. And bless the people's church folk of this morning. Others who would listen in, friends and family and people that we know who listen to this message. Let them too be refreshed and encouraged this morning. We continue to pray for our nation. We continue to pray for our leaders. We continue to pray for all that's happening and going on. Because Lord, we trust in you. Our trust is in you. Our hope is in you. Our hope isn't in all the vaccines and, and everything else. As much as it's great we've discovered these things. We thank you for all the hard work of the NHS and all the rest. But Lord, we look to you that others would find you. And Lord, we're praying for people, especially in these few weeks, Lord, who discovered they've got cancer. Some with only weeks to live. And, and, and Father, we, we just ask that you would touch and you would undertake. Uh, and Lord, where there's life, there's hope. Lord, this morning. Oh, where there's that breath, there's still that life. Where there's that life, there is still that hope. And we lay them before you this morning. And we just ask that you would undertake for each and every one. Bless those that are grieving. Touch those that need a touch this morning. Raise people up. And we'll be careful this morning, dear. With all the praise, the honour, the glory and the thanks. In your lovely name. Amen. Good morning. God bless you, church. Have a great week.
Thank mm-hmm. you.